Hello, this is Kyle Matthews of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Uh, proud to have uh, a good group of people today for a Google Plus Hangout on using tech to fight atrocities. Um, as we know, uh, the social media revolution, the technology revolution that's taken place in the last few years has created enormous new tools to be used by human rights uh, advocates, uh, NGOs, think tanks, to, uh, to be used to, for the protection of civilians and to prevent uh, mass atrocity crimes, or at least to provide evidence or what some has called the power of witness to actually uh, detect that to be used for further prosecution. So I'm very excited to, to have uh, uh, three guests today that are experts in the field that work with organizations or university centers that are at the cutting edge of studying technology and using technology for the purpose of preventing and halting mass atrocity crimes. And um, my, my first, uh, well, my, my only three speakers, first I'd like to introduce Christopher uh, Tuckwood. Uh, Christopher is the executive director of the Toronto-based NGO Sentinel Project for genocide prevention. They've been doing some groundbreaking, groundbreaking work, uh, creating something called Hate Base, uh, thinking about different ways to use technology. Uh, they are really, I think, one of the most innovative uh, NGOs in Canada right now, looking at this issue. So I'm very proud to have Christopher with us today. Uh, I also have with us um, Akshaya Kumar from the Enough Project. Uh, she's the analysis for Sudan and the South Sudan policy analysis for that organization, which is based at the Center for American Progress. Um, Akshaya also worked in the past in South Sudan, doing work for uh, uh, as a law fellow for the Public International Law and Policy Group that advised the government of South Sudan, and also did research for the International Labor, Labor Organization and the UN High Commissioner Refugees. So grateful to have you uh, here with us today. And last but not least, we also have Nathaniel Raymond. Uh, Nathaniel is uh, uh, someone who works at the, he's the director of the Signal program on human security technology at, at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative based at Harvard University. Um, he's also worked in the past for Oxfam and other humanitarian NGOs. So we're glad to have a group of people here that understand technology but have also worked in the field uh, and can actually take it outside of the tech bubble and, uh, and, and, and put it to use technology in a practical way uh, on the ground in countries that are at risk of atrocities. So I, I'm, I'm going to just open up the question. I think a lot of people watching this uh, would like to know, how can we use tech to fight atrocities? How can it be used to actually protect civilians? And, and maybe I'll just pose the, um, the question to all of you. Uh, maybe, um, actually, I will ask you to go first, but to talk about how you're using technology, your organization, how you study it, and, and, and what are the potentials? Sure. Uh, so at the Enough Project, we collaborate with a private satellite company called Digital Globe. And uh, together, we form the Satellite Sentinel Project, which focuses on Sudan to raise awareness and document crimes and also make predictions, early warning, and human security warnings about uh, the potential for violence against civilians in the war-torn areas of that country. And so for us, we really see tech as an integral tool to our methodology. We're our coordinating on a daily basis to task satellites, to look for very particular uh, portions of the country based on what we're hearing from our partners in the field. And then we work to make sure that that information gets out to a broader audience using tech as well, using social media, using Google Maps to you know plot the different actions that are occurring. And uh, all of it together, I think, is a key instrument for our broader policy and advocacy work at the Enough Project. Fascinating. Christopher, would you like to actually add and talk about what the Sentinel Project is uh, is doing with tech? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're not uh, we're not as specialized in one particular type of technology. You know, for instance, satellite imagery. Uh, we have a kind of, I guess, a, a bit broader or more opportunistic in the way that we look at at technology and kind of our view is that uh, we live so a lot of the ideas behind you know for instance the prediction of, of mass atrocities whether it be genocide or something else the theory behind that is not terribly new uh, you know people have had there's been research happening about this sort of thing for decades but the ability to gather a lot of the information that can feed the early warning process uh, and then the ability to communicate quickly uh, and relatively easily with large numbers of people is something fairly new. Just within, you know, the last decade or so has that been, been possible. So while a lot of the theory that might have been there, you know, 20 or 30 years ago 
uh, was useful, uh, the majority of people in the world at that time didn't really have access to communications technology. Um, you know, maybe the most advanced thing that the average person would have access to would be like a television or a landline phone or maybe a fax machine 30 years ago. As where today, we live in a world where there are, you know, 2 billion active internet users, almost as many mobile phones as there are people in the world, uh, and really rapidly increasing number of those our smartphones, uh, et cetera. So we have, you know, we have this sort of ability to now to reach out and theoretically talk to anybody in the world um, in order to gather information and then issue warnings back out. That's just looking at it from an early warning perspective. I could kind of go on beyond that, but, uh, but I won't right now. But that's kind of our, our general sort of feeling regarding technology and how it fits into early warning is just that we have this big opportunity now to gather information and communicate a lot more broadly and effectively than we ever could in the past. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nathaniel. That's very interesting. Um, uh, Nathaniel, would you like to actually add in about the work you're doing at Harvard and uh, and, and how it fits into what the other uh, speakers have, have uh, told us? Um, I'd love to. So the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology uh, began as an outgrowth of the Satellite Sentinel Project at the uh, Enough Project, uh, which um, my colleague, Ashkaya, is uh, currently involved with. We designed and managed the initial iteration of the Satellite Sentinel project uh, for monitoring Sudan and ended our involvement in the summer of 2012 uh, because we felt that there was an urgent need to develop uh, forensic standards for the collection of evidence remotely, to develop uh, ethical and technical standards because right now we're making it up as we go along. And the third sort of lesson we learned out of Satellite Sentinel, which we focus on, is to develop a rights-based approach to the use of information communication technologies with vulnerable populations. So right now, our focus is on the methodological gaps, the ethical um, gaps, and the legal and pedagogical gaps in this type of work. Um, and in the case of environments which uh, can produce mass atrocities, we're dealing with some of the most vulnerable populations in the world. And what we are really focused on out of our experience in Satellite Sentinel and other experiences remotely monitoring alleged mass atrocities is basically um, how do we prevent um, increasing the vulnerability of these populations. Um, and that's our, our number one concern. And it has less to do with technology and more to do with the theory of its application uh, with people in extremely vulnerable situations. I'm already getting one question from someone viewing us online from Matthew Crane. He asks, do NGOs like yours work with a variety of satellite imagery providers other than Digital Globe? Who wants to take uh, that? Maybe I can jump in first because we're the ones who use satellite imagery on a regular basis. Uh, we have an exclusive contract with Digital Globe, uh, which recently acquired another satellite imagery company called GOI. So we have access uh, to about five satellites on a daily basis, and through our contract, we're able to identify taskings for those satellites uh, on a systematic basis. So at least at Enough and at SSP, the Satellite Sentinel Project, we have an exclusive contract, but we think that it really gives us a good deal of coverage and information uh, about the areas that we're most interested in. That's really interesting because I, I wrote a piece a little while ago for the Canadian International Council about um, how groups are using technology and, and it's interesting that just a few years ago, I mean maybe 10 years ago, this satellite imagery or the use of satellites was only really, um, only, you know, I would say, you know, 10 very powerful countries in the world could, 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 would have access to this and now we have non-for-profits and charities that are actually um, accessing this and and just this week uh, Human Rights Watch released uh, some satellite images of the Central African Republic showing some of the villages that were attacked. Um, are, are we going to see more NGOs uh, using this in the future or do you see it just falling in line with, with one particular or maybe one or two organizations? I, I would expect that it's going to become increasingly more um, more accessible for NGOs as well as you know smaller companies in the private sector and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, the technology will likely just become more accessible. I can't speak as much for, uh, once again, for satellite imagery. I think the others can, but we have a similar kind of view of things like um, 
the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, which also 10 years ago were strictly the preserve of, uh, you know, government, government bodies, so militaries, intelligence agencies, that sort of thing. And then now today, the, you know, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to employ some of this technology anymore, but it's hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, which is a lot more uh, accessible. And that's why you start to see, not so much in the civilian protection or, or uh, atrocity prevention world, but you see other NGOs doing things like de disaster response or conservation or anti-poaching work using unmanned aerial vehicles. So I think that not just specifically with satellite imagery, but with all technologies, uh, this is kind of the general trend. It usually starts off as very expensive and exclusive, whether in you know corporate or government hands, and then becomes more accessible for other purposes over time. I but like, I think that wouldn't apply here. I'd like to actually ask a question to uh, Nathaniel about the the ethic, the ethical issues surrounding the use of of such um, such images. Like, what are they? What would a, a human rights organization or an NGO have to worry about, about how they, they gather this, uh, this, these images and how they, they diffuse them to the wider public? Uh, the main thing that you need to be concerned about in a mass atrocity producing environment with satellite imagery is that when you release the images, you're giving actionable intelligence about your capabilities to the perpetrator. And they... Uh, in the case of Sudan, they learn um, and they adapt. So the thing to think about as we inject new capabilities into this environment, often driven by an advocacy focus and a uh, attempt to try to often get out ahead of other organizations with new intel, is the fact that we are causing mutation in the environment. Um, by the alleged perpetrator. So some specific examples. Um, now we've seen evidence in the case of Syria and, and elsewhere that they look closely for unique signal profiles of people communicating through VGAN or satellite phone um, to communicate as ground truthers, quote unquote, with folks elsewhere. As we've learned in the case of Syria, they can then use that signal to lock on to your ground source with a radar guided missile and kill them. Um, they've attempted to do that in other countries, particularly in Africa. Um, so the point I'm making here is that we are now having a direct interface through these technologies with the perpetrator and their calculations. And their tactical interface um, with these populations is now being shaped by the fact that they think they're communicating with us to inform uh, geospatial reconnaissance. Well, that's... Those are important issues to consider when, when using uh, these technologies. Um, we have someone uh, dialing in from, or not dialing in, but asking a question from Washington. We have Sally Smith from the Nexus Fund. And she asks, are any of you working with people on the ground in at-risk or crisis areas to identify their needs, i.e. atrocity prevention response, and get their input in order to connect with them in a, uh, with innovation technology or to develop new forms of technology to meet their needs? Would anyone like to take a, a stab and, and try to answer that one? Uh, I can share a couple of thoughts preliminarily, and uh, it looks like Chris has some ideas as well. Uh, as far as our work, we communicate pretty frequently with uh, two groups of people, and I think they're kind of disparate. One is a network of human rights monitors and uh, citizen journalists who are in the areas like South Kordofan, the Nuba Mountains, and Blue Nile states in Sudan, and want to assist in documenting the crimes of their government. And so we work with them to corroborate their information and also to help inform what we're seeing with the satellite imagery so that our picture and our understanding of what we see from 300 miles in space is more robust. The second group of people who we've been increasingly working with, um, more as a part of our Enough Project policy imperative to think of ways to stand with Sudanese Democrats and support civil society as they push for more space uh, to express their own views and opinions, is thinking about information communication technologies and how new tools, whether they're to circumvent uh, online censorship or to provide encryption for safe communications could be deployed in Sudan, what are the hurdles, whether they're legal within the United States, such as sanctions, 
or financial or logistical or training or education or capacity and how can we break those down and so those are um, those are the two parallel tracks that we have one is a feedback loop so that what we see with our satellite imagery is informed by what's happening and what people are seeing on the ground and vice versa and the other is to increase the capacity of those people operating on the ground to get the message out themselves well, thank you um, you know, well, one question I have as a former humanitarian aid worker and as a diplomat in the UN, um, when, when I hear of people using tech, I, I sometimes wonder if there's a bridge between uh, the, the technical people that are developing these tools but are disconnected from the policy making process or those that are working on the ground or trying to reach uh, the decision makers that can actually, uh, you know, push the envelope further uh, in national capitals. Uh, do, do you guys feel that this, this the silo is breaking down between uh, tech entrepreneurs and human rights advocates and decision makers, or is it still kind of very much something that has to be um, that, that has to be bridged? Um, our, our experience, uh, Kyle, as we wrote about in the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs, is that what we found, um, at least in the case of Satellite Sentinel in Sudan, is that it did not seem to have a direct causal effect on the decisions of policymakers, at least in the case of Sudan. And I think um, that it's an interesting dynamic to watch in terms of um, how new types of information that can be collected through these sensors and approaches um, force governments to disclose more of their internal intelligence analysis and makes aspects of that more transparent and ways in which it, it, it does or does not move the needle on the other side in terms of public response or outcry. Um, I think what we're really interested in is um, the need for something akin to sphere standards or the humanitarian charter in terms of uh, minimum standards of protection and uh, basic standards of how this work is done. I think until there's a sphere standard equivalent, the type of integration of this into the humanitarian practice space is going to be slow because in many ways on the operational side for humanitarians they see it as a liability and there isn't a pedagogy and training to be able to integrate it as you would standard delivery of food, water, shelter, protection work, etc. Awesome. Anyone else want to make a comment on, on that? No? I will. I have, Chris, if you have something, I'll let you go. But I had a thought as well. Sure, go ahead. Uh, just on the idea of silos between tech entrepreneurs and activists, both on the ground and in places like um, Washington or Ottawa, I think that there at least from my work for the over the past few years, I've seen an increasing uh, bridge between those three communities and an interest from tech entrepreneurs who also have uh, a vision for social justice and a personal commitment, a moral commitment to uh, using tech for good. Uh, there's a lot of openness and interest in how technology can be used to leverage opportunities, to pry open political space, to raise awareness. And so we've had a, we've had a great deal of success uh, collaborating with some cutting edge tech firms. And I think that more of that needs to happen. And uh, raising awareness in both communities of each other is critical. It's something that I've been trying to do a lot lately, even through social media, introducing for example, Sudanese activists who uh, faced the impact of their government shutting down the internet for 24 hours to some ideas from either Google Ideas or Get Lantern or, you know, Silent Circle, these uh, new tools that are coming out that probably came from a movement about anonymous and using the internet freely without the NSA, a, a very Western perspective and bringing those to a different context, a more uh, revolutionary context or a more organizing context. I think it's really interesting. Fantastic. Uh, Chris, do you want to add in something there or should I go to questions from, uh, from people watching online? Yeah, I can uh, just add sort of a, maybe a note of caution is that um, probably there is sort of a breakdown of a, any sort of barrier between people who work in the technology you know, kind of world, whatever you want to call that, um, who, you know, work exclusively with technology and don't necessarily give a lot of thought to the social impacts of what they do versus who users could be, whether it's governments or NGOs and whatnot. And 
overall, by and large, that's a that's a good thing, uh, of course. Um, but there can be, you know, unintended consequences. So caused oftentimes by over enthusiasm for technology, and this is one of the things that we actually address in our training course on using technology for defending human rights and that kind of thing is the technology, so to speak. There's, you know, a lot of people just talk about technology uh, rather than specific tools. And it's like there's this box of, you know, some substance called technology somewhere that you pull out and can apply it to a problem, which isn't the case. It's not a silver bullet. And in the past, you know, there are some examples from like the Green Revolution in Iran in 2009 and that sort of thing where inappropriate uh, tools were being produced in the West and then greenlit by, you know, like the U.S. State Department for export to Iran where they'd be used by activists and that sort of thing. And then it was discovered after the fact that they had all kinds of, uh, you know, technology or security holes and whatnot that actually ended up putting people at risk. But there was so much sort of unguarded um, enthusiasm for technology uh, that uh, that things like that ended up happening and mistakes were made. So I think, you know, there's something like what Nathaniel was talking about, the establishment of standards for how tools of this sort could be applied, um, and that would go a long way to solving that that problem or mitigating that risk. Yeah, oh, no, I think that's a very important point. I'm going to go to people following us online now. We have Daniela Chivu from Montreal asking, so far, how did satellite imagery help in the ongoing war in Syria? My second question is the following. How can the satellite imagery help Syrian refugee women from being raped? Meaning, how could this method increase the level of security in the camps? Does anyone know of any of this technology being used in the Syria context or in refugee camps? I, I open the floor to, to my three experts. Um, there's a lot been uh, a lot of incidental use of satellite imagery um, in reference to Syria. Uh, the Amnesty Human Rights Watch have done different reports. We've done internal analysis as part of our research uh, that we haven't released yet at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Uh, and then the State Department released um, a, a large amount of Digital Globe and uh, um, other satellite imagery online. Now, in terms of the question of how it can be used in refugee camps, the individual nature of uh, sexual and gender-based violence uh, means that the actual um, forensic evidence of individual acts of rape cannot be seen from the satellite. Um, that said, where satellites can relate to displaced persons camps or um, refugee camps, an, an area we're working on, uh, which is part of our, our winning submission to the Mass Atrocity um, Tech Challenge with USAID and Humanity United, is trying to develop um, standard manual and algorithmic tools for doing population estimates um, remotely in camps. So what we're working on now is developing a standard technical tool and method for um, estimating uh, population change into camps. So while that does not document rape and uh, or sexual gender-based violence, it does help us uh, understand macro trends in observable objects that you can see from satellite imagery in camps. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually seeing someone uh, ask another question saying, are any of you using non-satellite photographic imagery but still remotely acquired data to detect human rights abuses? So, we do with SSP, uh, but you can go ahead too. Go ahead. Okay, I was just saying that we do with SSP, but we often pair it with satellite imagery. So we get a photo that was geotagged, uh, that was taken in some place in South Kordofan or Blue Nile, and then we use those same geo coordinates to secure satellite imagery of the area that shows a consistent uh, pattern of either destruction or uh, displacement or violence, and then we pair those two things together, and that offers, I think, uh, you know, going to the issue of standards and credibility and ethical checks that we try to at least um, recently since I've been here add you know a second level of confirmation before we publish something and whether that's a publishable level of confirmation like a photo or a non-publishable level of confirmation like um, oral communication with someone in the field we always try to do that so that we know that what we think we're seeing in the satellite imagery is probably what's actually happening in uh, places in Sudan that are difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I'd like to ask a question, I think just for our audience to understand, what are some of the things you can detect uh, using satellite imagery uh, to, to, to show that atrocities might be looming or they've taken place? What are some of the examples? Is it burnt villages? Is it uh, unearthed graves? What, what are you finding uh, th through this imagery? Uh, so at the Satellite Sentinel project, we found uh, a number of different uh, things can be seen through satellites, and you know it's it's actually a startling level of detail. So I, I would divide your question up into two things: like what are we able to document after the fact, and we've been able to document things like you said, burned villages, croplands, counting how many individual huts had been burned, also specifically identifying what type of buildings were being bombed, uh, whether they were churches or schools or, you know, humanitarian insti um, institutions like hospitals. And all of that, I think, works from a documentation perspective to raise awareness and create a clear picture of what has happened. Now, from the early warning or predictive capabilities, what we've increasingly been doing is focusing on the deployment of troops and the positioning of aerial assets in key installations. And so in the past year, we've been able to do things like identify new acquisitions in Sudan's aerial arsenal that increase targeting capability and range and put those out in public knowledge, especially when they were acquired uh, in ways that could potentially be violative of end-user license agreements. And so that, I think, is a, it's a really interesting nexus between the law and what we see with satellite imagery and the potential for atrocity prevention. And then more broadly, when we see a huge buildup of troops in a particular area or attacks on some strategic locations, we, with the, cons the broad consultations that we do with human rights monitors and citizen journalists in the field, can make some judgments and assessments about whether we think a new campaign is brewing, and if it does brew, who might be at the most risk. Uh, and we think that by doing that, our hope is to, you know, um, I think Nathaniel mentioned that satellite imagery can change the actions of the perpetrators. And it is our hope to change the actions of the perpetrators, to let them know that we are watching this particular village. We already saw some small things happen here. And so if anything big happens, that will be very clearly documented and a huge, uh, you know, a huge issue from an advocacy perspective. Or we have found these planes, and if you use them in any place outside this particular range, it's a violation of UN sanctions, and we're watching every time you move the planes. So any moment that the violation occurs, then that would be something that could go to the UN Sanctions Committee or even the Security Council. Uh, ju just to respond and amend one point, when I was saying it was changing the actions of the perpetrators, um, I was saying it's making them smarter. Mm. And um, I think that persistent uh, tasking of satellites in an active battle space um, has to be done with a full assessment and a full acceptance um, from an ethical and moral perspective um, that you are probably giving more actionable intelligence um, to the potential perpetrator, then you are going to move the political um, needle. And that, that was a hard lesson out of Satellite Sentinel, is that at the end of the day, um, we, two things happened. One, we were moving into a type of forensic evidence collection um, with the program for which there was no forensic theory. So we were collecting shell casings, but we had no science of ballistics. <laughs> the second thing that was ha happening is that we had no um, broader um, judicial mandate or um, concept of chain of custody. So the fact is, is right now you have multiple satellite monitors with no theory of forensics and multiple satellite monitoring groups um, with no theory of chain of custody. So um, we do not have consistent evidence collection, and probably it would largely be inadmissible. Um, so a lot of what we're concerned with is the, the twofold problem. How do we have a theory about understanding what the risk of these platforms are and how we develop threat matrices and a theory of risk for the, the human beings we could be endangering? And the second is how do we move this from something that's often done in advocacy context to bring attention to something to an actual science of forensic investigation. And, and right now we're at the 
at the very earliest stage of both, unfortunately. Oh, fascinating. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything, or, or do you want to move on to other questions from the, um, from the audience? Uh, yeah, I think we can move on. We don't actually have a whole lot to add on the specific topic of satellite imagery, because we're not experienced in working with that. So. Okay. Yeah, well, I could just uh, respond to something that Nathaniel said. I think that it's certainly a judgment call to decide whether or not, and in any particular instance and every time before we decide to publish a report, it's a judgment call to decide whether or not sharing information will move the needle from an advocacy perspective, will raise awareness, could potentially put people at risk or in danger, or could uh, raise the pressure internationally on a government that at certain times does respond to international pressure. And we do weigh and assess all of those things before we make a decision to publish uh, imagery, and we, we strive to do to do so in a way that is responsible. I think to say, to make an assessment and say that the Satellite Sentinel project on the whole doesn't move the needle as opposed to the risk that it puts uh, civilians at is is a problematic assessment because the project has continued for over a year since Harvard Humanitarian Initiative's involvement and we've seen a number of successes over time uh, both in feedback from policymakers and in use of the Security Council in private consultations and so that we know that this information is being used because of the way that we publish it even if the same information might be being collected by US or UN satellites independently. And um, we're very conscious to the potential for putting civilians at risk, and that's why we collaborate so closely with a network of citizen journalists to get their assessment of when and where to uh, use the imagery and what it's actually telling, what kind of a story it is, it is being told. Interesting. I, I actually have uh, someone uh, named Timothy uh, Reuter who's actually, and I think this is going to be directed more towards you, Chris, because you've actually written about the use of drones or, or, um, or UAEs, but he basically um, says that, um, okay, okay, he says, for anyone interested in experimental experimenting with low-cost unmanned aerial vehicles to tackle this challenge, the Drone User Group Network is offering a $10,000 prize for the most socially beneficial use of a low-cost UAV. So there are actually people out there now that are actually giving, you know, small seed money to get people to think about how they can be used for humanitarian purposes. But then he goes on to, to pose a question. He says, are, are you aware of anyone using UAVs for atrocity prevention? I'd be especially interested to hear about the use of non-military platforms or NGO use of this technology. Chris, you've written about this. Where yeah. is this going? Yeah, so specifically on, uh, on using it for atrocity prevention, no. Uh, to my knowledge, there's nobody, no NGOs formally using the technology in that way. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, talking and writing and thinking and, and whatnot about this, and we do want to, um, in the relatively near future, transition into actually employing the technology for this purpose. Uh, it's really just a question of uh, resources and then also finding an appropriate use case. Uh, but there are examples of uh, UAV technology being used, like I alluded to earlier, in a lot of other humanitarian applications. So things like um, for disaster response, there are a lot of applications there, as well as in some development applications. And then there are several uh, places now around uh, both Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa where uh, UAVs are being used for anti-poaching patrols and that sort of thing. Um, coordinated and integrated with other information sources and then used to um, not only document but actually in a way do early warning for uh, poaching and use that to support uh, conservation officers on the ground and direct them more effectively. So those are the kind of some examples of the humanitarian use cases that there are being done in a formal way by NGOs. Uh, we've seen human rights activists in a few isolated cases in places in Eastern Europe as well as actually uh, Turkey earlier this year during a large protest using small kind of, um, you know, like retail uh, or like consumer style or recreational models of UAVs for things like filming protests from a bird's eye view and whatnot. Um, specifically, not just filming protests, but actually like security forces reactions to it. Uh, so that's a, a form of... Um, informal human rights, sort of ad hoc human rights documentation that's happened using the technology. But uh, yeah, to my knowledge, as far as uh, you know, civilian protection in an atrocity, mass atrocities type situation goes, there's nobody currently doing that 
uh, right now, but we would very much like to get into it ourselves. Um, we've written an article about this um, in Open Canada for the uh, uh, Canada International Council, um, arguing against um, the use of drones and humanitarian uh, response and other types of protection situations for a couple reasons. One, the international law is clear. You can shoot them down. Um, and the, the issue is, is that if you have a bird um, up in the air that's big enough to travel the distance you need in most uh, mass atrocity situations, you have a lot of fuel on that bird. Um, so you have something that can be legally shot down even by a perpetrator government. Um, and you have to set up a huge relay rig to try to get the larger uh, birds. I'm not talking a microcopter, but something with a fixed wing. Um, so our, our, our feeling is, is that the risks for ground population and the cost and the operational inefficiency for a big fixed wing uh, doesn't recommend it. Um, frankly, I think that satellites, um, despite the awful price point of satellite imagery, it's far cheaper and far less risky uh, than, than major drone deployment. Microcopters in some incidental circumstances may make sense when deployed by um, nationals of that country, but outside deployment uh, by, by, of fixed wings by groups is highly problematic. Yeah, actually, uh, I read your article. I read or wrote one for uh, Open Canada around the same time. Um, and you're right; there definitely are risks associated with it. But uh, I don't, I don't think it's right to make just sort of a blanket statement saying that you know this technology is never appropriate. Like you said, smaller, maybe rotary, uh, like rotary wing type craft could be used on, in some incidental cases. Uh, we have a particular interest here in actually localizing our efforts, so not doing necessarily strategic level kind of early warning. Um, you know, which would require larger devices, but actually using perhaps this technology for uh, local level surveillance and providing security around, let's say, a particular village or a particular group of villages. Uh, in which case, a large, very expensive, um, you know, fixed wing craft would not necessarily be necessary or even the most appropriate device. Um, so you know that's just that's just one example of where we would see it potentially being used and providing some kind of value and not necessarily having the same level of risk uh, associated that or attached to it that, that you just outlined. But you're right. Um, I would also draw a distinction when talking about UAVs though between something like what what you described, uh, you know, perhaps flying a flying a large fixed wing uh, craft into into a denied area, perhaps across, you know, international borders where the uh, the state that you are sort of uh, penetrating could legally shoot it down uh, versus working in a more permissive environment where you could actually uh, be working with at least the tacit sort of approval or consent of the host country's uh, government because not every mass atrocity scenario necessarily has the state uh, as the perpetrator. So, you know, there could be examples. I've actually talked to some people about, um, you know, employing this kind of technology in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, there could be various other cases where, you know, the perpetrator is non-state. And so we don't have to worry about some of those, some of those difficulties. Yeah, and if we're, I could just jump the in thing. there, uh, I would just wanted to add that, from what I understand, uh, the UN peacekeeping mission in the Eastern DRC in MONUSCO has uh, explored and has begun using some UAVs uh, for monitoring purposes and uh, other peacekeeping missions both um, in Sudan and in South Sudan have also uh, looked into contracts and the reason that this stuff is helpful from a civilian protection perspective is that it provides a degree of detail uh, about what's happening in really impenetrable areas that are difficult for peacekeepers to patrol on foot and uh, over regions where there's a significant risk of UN helicopters being shot down and they have been shot down and so the opportunity for these missions to instead use UAVs for surveillance purposes to detect the movement of columns of uh, you know fighters from a particular tribe who are about to attack another tribe is really significant and something that we think is quite cutting edge. It's great to see the UN doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, you know, you brought up the, 
sort of the, the point of using this technology to uh, sort of um, supplement or even replace uh, you know, manned uh, or personnel um, sort of operated flight, uh, which was something similar to the admittedly anecdotal uh, kind of thing that I alluded to uh, in eastern Congo, where the issue was not only, um, you know, atrocities against humans, but also poaching and that sort of thing. The, um, the park rangers that operate in that area against poachers already use small uh, manned aircraft to patrol the area, which are expensive, can potentially be shot down, they occasionally get shot at, in which case it does pose some of you know the risks to people on the ground that Nathaniel outlined, uh, et cetera. But if you can achieve the same you know objective to gather the same imagery and so on using a UAV where humans are not at risk, at least inside the craft, uh, it's less expensive, et cetera, there are definite advantages there. Um, I'd like to actually, uh, there, we're going to, uh, quite a few other questions coming in, I'd like to uh, tackle some of those, but, but sure. one, some of the questions uh, are, are bring us more towards not um, at the, the early stages of, of how uh, hate speech begins. Uh, we've had Erwin Kotler, a very uh, well-known human rights lawyer, he's a member of parliament, and he's told us n numerous times here speaking at our institute that genocide, mass atrocities don't begin with, with, with actions, they begin with words. It's about demonizing a certain group, about about inculcating society to, to see another group as a subhuman. So people are asking me about hate speech and technology, um, about what are the connections there. And and one question it comes from from Ted uh, Promoter in New York says a question about hate speech. Uh, much of the theory that I have read is as concerned with who is speaking as with who is listening, as well as the content of the speech. How can linguistic analysis uh, take those more context variables into account. Um, does anyone want to tackle this? I know it's different from satellite imagery, but does anyone have anything to say on, on this particular issue? I can uh, I can take that, since we actually do have an active project right now related to hate speech. Um, so yes, uh, hate speech is definitely significant for the reasons that, that you said. You know, whether it's, you could call it dehumanization or demonization or what have you, this ability to influence to communicate, you know, hateful thoughts and influence other people to view a particular group as dangerous or less than human or what have you is a really important, uh, a really important initial sort of step uh, along the spectrum that ultimately generally, you know, ultimately can end in killing. Um, we can say, you know, not everything that begins with hate speech or discriminatory language ends in a mass atrocity, but definitely everything that ends in a mass atrocity at some point uh, probably had a, a sort of beginning in discriminatory or hateful language. And so being able to monitor that in some way is very useful from an early warning perspective, but for the reasons that Ted mentioned, also very difficult. Uh, context is really important, considering who the speaker is is really important, who the audience is is really important. Um, which is why actually there's a, some research that's been done uh, just within the last year coming out of Kenya. So uh, Susan Benish, an American uh, researcher, was working with um, was working with iHub Research in Nairobi, who's actually now our partner on our uh, misinformation project in uh, the Tana Delta. But uh, one of the results that came out of that was drawing kind of a distinction between uh, hate speech and dangerous speech. Uh, the, gener the basic distinction being that dangerous speech is kind of a subset of hate speech, where it's specifically being spoken by a person who's in a position of influence uh, with a large audience in a situation where people are likely to follow what they're saying. So, you know, an individual using a racial slur on the street might be uh, an example of hate speech, which is also significant, but much less significant than an individual on a radio station using that same slur in a, you know, on a show that's going to be heard by 100,000 people and also attaching to it a call to action. So not just that members of group X are Y, but members of group X are Y and therefore you should do, you know, this action, whether that's just simply to discriminate against them or stop, you know, interacting with them socially or perhaps in extreme cases to actually, you know, isolate and kill them. Um, so that's, that's really important, but, and then I'll wrap up because I'm kind of going on, but the difficulty is when we're using technology to monitor that kind of thing, uh, being able to distinguish between, you know, what is 
what is hate speech, what is dangerous speech, and then what are sort of false positives. And our hate-based project has been uh, kind of um, trying to tackle this issue. Uh, right now, we're just exclusively monitoring uh, social media, so particularly Twitter, and looking at what people are saying on there. So when certain uh, keywords that are listed as hate speech in our database come up, um, we look at, uh, you know, those get kind of flagged. But the context issue uh, comes up because, you know, a lot of words, whether it's used, if it's used by a member of one group, might be considered hateful, as where if it's used by a member of another group, might not be considered hateful. Uh, some, you know, racial or ethnic slurs are very, uh, very ambiguous. For instance, the use of the word uh, yellow, perhaps, you know, some people would use as a slur against uh, Asians, as where there are you know, 99% of the use of that word on Twitter, for instance, is just using it as in the color yellow to refer to, you know, the, the flower is yellow or something, you know, totally innocuous like that. So we need to kind of teach the software or train the software on how to distinguish between cases like that so that when we start to see trends of, you know, increasing levels of hate speech against particular groups in particular areas, that we're actually getting an accurate picture of what's happening and can really use that for for meaningful early warning, potentially. Thanks so much, Chris. Anyone else have anything to say on that, or should I go to the next question? Next question. Sure. I have um, Sally from the Nexus Fund is asking, can you comment on any new uses of mobile technology that are being used for atrocity prevention and response? Is that um, anyone? Please go, Nathaniel. Um, no, uh, Chris, go for it. I can follow up. Okay. Well, I mean, there are, I think, are several cases of this. I'll just, um, I can just mention something that we're actually starting right now. It's our first kind of real field project, so um, it might be it might be of interest. Uh, basically, I, I mentioned the Tana Delta earlier, um, or just alluded to it. It's an area in eastern Kenya where there were a series of uh, relatively small-scale inter-ethnic massacres late last year and early this year. Um, so we're looking at this as, you know, something, uh, a fairly self-contained area, kind of a small-scale or micro-level micro um, testbed for some of these concepts that we have around use of mobile technology. And when we went into the area earlier this year, and then I was there just last week as well, we recognized that misinformation is a big driver of um, the conflict slash atrocities in the area. The two primary ethnic groups have a lot of misconceptions about each other, uh, you know, which lead them to view each other as, you know, threatening, dishonest, etc. Um, rumors like, you know, one people or people in one one uh, village strongly believe that people in the opposing village on the other side of the river have been supplied by some outside actor with uh, 3,000 AK-47s for the purpose of destroying the opposing group, or things like, you know, a health worker from one ethnic group or another, um, you know, was trying to inject poison rather than vaccine into the children of the other group, that sort of thing. Now, are these true? Probably not, but enough people believe them that they might as well be true, and ultimately, as we've seen in the past, those rumors can escalate to the point where people will actually band together and launch you know, preemptive or retaliatory attacks against the opposing ethnic group. So fortunately, it's all been on a relatively small scale uh, so far, but our goal is to prevent that from happening again or prevent it at least from growing beyond where it is. So what we're doing is setting up a mobile phone-based uh, reporting system in the area where if people hear rumors or simply want to report incidents that they may take as completely true and not realize are rumors, they can report that in via voice or SMS, so text messaging, or through one of our uh, volunteer ambassadors that we're planning to sort of disperse throughout the, the community. And then we will actually do our best to uh, investigate and verify or, uh, you know, unverify those, those reports and then actually report back to people and say, you know, this is true, this is untrue, this is why, uh, and actually kind of try to contain uh, and counter that misinformation so that it doesn't lead to violence. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll be going back in January, February to really set this up in earnest and have a more extended uh, presence in the area. But mobile phones are going to play a really key, um, a really key role there because it's a very... A uh, very impoverished area where most people are not internet users. There's actually not even a local radio station or uh, newspaper or anything like that. People just get news but purely by word of mouth. Uh, 
So we actually have a you know good potential to set up a trusted neutral source of information there, and uh, and hopefully reduce the risk of future atrocities. That's fantastic. Anyone else want to make a comment following uh, Chris? Or can I go to our first Twitter question? Let's let's go to the first Twitter question. Okay. So I have a question from Colette Mazzuccelli, who's a friend of our institute. She's based in New York and, and uh, taught uh, at our program this summer here, our professional training program. She, um, I think it might be directed towards you, Nathan, so just want to give you a heads up. She says, how do we move from advocacy to a science of forensic investigation? Um, well, if I can jump on that, I think the, the first thing is uh, that we have to be able to determine what has probative value. And uh, I'm using a legal term here because uh, we can see ground scorching from space. We can receive through mobile devices um, and algorithmically process reports of alleged mass atrocities, but we don't have a theory yet of how these bits of ones and zeros relate to um, a theory of a crime uh, in the way that we do if you find a body with certain forensic uh, sequelae such as you know ligature marks around the neck and certain types of bruising um, can be can, is known by investigators to be consistent with strangulation um, we need to develop that same approach bit by bit for each type of alleged mass atrocity that we're trying to document and the, the problem is is that we're doing that in an environment where these activities are largely driven by advocacy not by science and they're technically human subjects research in some cases and that's a really important point here is we're conducting experimental applications of technology on live highly vulnerable populations the joke I like to make is if you have a bunch of kids who ate cancer and they made their homemade chemo and hopped in a van and started handing it out at hospitals they'd be arrested um, but the fact is is that we are um, because they'd be violating human subjects research and FDA guidelines the point is we don't have human subjects research and FDA guidelines for experimental uses of these technologies so it makes it very hard to ground it in science so how do we resolve that well we need to resolve it by very clearly differentiating when we're engaged in a forensic in evidence collection act and when we're engaged in an advocacy act and we have to begin to focus the resources on creating evidence examples and looking at them in the way we we, we did with cadavers in the early days of um, forensic um, physical forensic development and begin to develop um, tested um, e examples and archives of examples um, that can be used to illustrate theories of what forensic evidence present in data relates to evidence of what crime and I think the first step there is to move beyond verification um, it's not about verification it's about uh, cross corroboration and to do that it's got to be a theory of what constitutes a specific violation um, rather than about confirming an event did the, any of that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it did. It mostly went over my head, but I'm going to be thinking about that and rewatching the video for, for hours probably after this. Uh, anyone else uh, ha have anything to, to comment after Nathaniel, or should I go to uh, our next question? Uh, yeah, no, I would just support his point that that's actually really important to have established these standards because oftentimes we are engaged in what is arguably scientific work when we're developing or you know adapting or adopting new tools and kind of just seeing what happens in a lot of cases it needs to be a bit more thought given to it. Um, our project in the Tana Delta is kind of a hybrid uh, project, you know, partially intended to be doing research and having kind of knowledge generation outcomes and learn lessons that can be applied elsewhere in the future, as well as, you know, an impact focused uh, project with the intent of saving lives. So. Um, you know, the research half of that we definitely do need to give thought to because it is essentially human subject research as, as he said and not just with people in a laboratory type environment but with people who are at risk of atrocities have in many cases been affected by atrocities in the past um, and so you know we have a, a fairly traumatized um, 
you know, population that we're working with there. And so we need to be sensitive to that. And it certainly applies in, you know, all other cases in, in some sense. I, I just wanted to chime in that I think one really interesting maybe oper operationalization of that idea is the fact that with our work with the Satellite Sentinel project, uh, we've transitioned over time from, especially originally with our collaboration um, with HHI and now to our work with Digital Globe, we rely on the expertise of uh, imagery analysts who have careers doing satellite imagery analysis for mostly U.S. intelligence gathering capabilities. And so that's it, it is it's a valuable point to say that. So the reason that I trust an assessment that comes from my imagery analyst is because of him and what I know that he's seen and his systematic review. But uh, it would certainly be better if there was a guidebook or an encyclopedia that said, okay, this is what a bomb crater looks like. Uh, and in some ways, that would it would democratize the process. You wouldn't be looking for an incredibly specialized uh, expertise that's developed over 30 years of knowing what to look for when they're scanning. And instead, you could have you know, a team of Harvard students who are really smart and had a, a, had a little key that said, OK, if you see this, this is probably what it is. But from our perspective right now, the, the, the way we go about it is we're relying on uh, individual, individual personal expertise to make those forensic assessments. So having a guidebook or a tool would be really uh, a way to standardize that, certainly. And I, I just want to say in response to that, though, this is a big issue she's raising, um, which is those analysts that she's talking about, analysts who I've worked with and, and respect very much, um, they're trained in what I would call gun sight analysis, which is they, they coming from the military intelligence background as it relates to this type of imagery, the, the, that training, that pedagogy, has been developed over decades and is highly inculcated in the analysts who use it, but it's, it's focused on observable objects in theories of threat assessment um, with a military focus. And while that is all, mostly applicable in the human security space, we have this magnificent gaping blind spot, which is understanding um, from a scientific basis, the, the patterns of causality a, as it relates to the evidence of a mass atrocity, which is not the same tank thing as tracking tanks. So, for, for example, um, and, and many of these analysts are extremely good at it, but it's not what they're intentionally trained at. No one right now, um, other than what we're trying to do here at Harvard, is intentionally trained at saying if, if we see this type of burn pattern with this type of um, displacement pattern, et cetera, et cetera, it is consistent with this violation of international law. And so right now the, the emerging forensic um, experience is not matched up with law and it's happening in the absence of jurisdiction. Um, so if you think about a crime scene, the moment a CSI goes into that crime scene, they're going in because they have jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction provides mandate, and that mandate and jurisdiction provides the basis of technical standards for achieving a chain of custody. So everything we're missing right now to develop that type of specific analytical skill set to a scientific level um, has nothing to do with technology. In many ways, it has to do with economics, and it has to do with a lack of political will um, internationally in terms of, of creating um, at ICC and, and elsewhere the capacity to develop the science. Thank you very much. We've just actually reached the end. We have, it's exactly 1 o'clock. We said we'd end here. I want to uh, thank all three of you for, on behalf of the Montreal Institute for Genocide Human Rights Studies and our Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to us today via, uh, via Google. Um, this will be available on YouTube and we'll share it by social media, so we hope that you'll share it among your colleagues too. And, and just one last time, thank you very much. We will. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All the best.